I first got introduced to opiates when I was like 14 years old. The first prescription drug that I remember taking of an opioid would be Vicodin. That quickly spiraled out of control. I got to the point in my addiction where I didn't have access to prescription drugs. They actually became harder to get, but heroin was much cheaper and it was everywhere. That obsession was just above all, and that was my mission, and that's what I would do, and I wouldn't stop until I could get heroin. When I hit my bottom it, a little over three years ago, um, I was just absolutely insane. Depression that was overwhelming. Um, I, I was suicidal, um, but I did not have the courage to carry out the act to end my life, but I felt that I was dead inside. It just all hit, like I, I had a moment of desperation, like that I can't go on like this. I had no other option but to take myself to urgent care. I walked in and just explained where I was mentally, physically, what my thoughts were, how I felt, how I didn't want to live anymore. And a social worker came in and she questioned me. And for some reason, for the first time, I think out of desperation, I was honest about my drug use. She actually looked at me and just said, you know, you're an addict and we're gonna get you into treatment. Finally, when I got there, I was surrounded by people who understood me for the first time, you know, cause I would always tell myself during active addiction, like no one understands and no one gets what what's going on up here, you know? I was just floored by the amount of patients that were there for opioids strictly. And a lot of them were there for their, you know, multiple times to try and kick the opioid addiction. I just did not realize how huge and widespread it is until then. I got to work through all this trauma that I had never faced head on since I was a, a child. I got to learn like how to be present. Like that was huge for me. Like I was always in active addiction, like condemning my future, like remembering like bad things and then, you know, ruining the, the present moment because I couldn't ever enjoy anything or just be here. Each person in recovery, I feel, is just a little notch in, in the huge, it, it's just something amazing that's happening. Hi, I'm Emily Hogarth, and I've been clean since August 19th, 2016. I was introduced to opiates my sophomore year in high school, and then by the end of my senior year, I was like fully addicted. It went downhill fast. Like Once I started shooting it, there was no turning back. And I just put everything, like everything I had into it. I was living in my ex-boyfriend's dad's car in his garage. Um, I was couch surfing. I was staying at my drug dealer's house. I started selling it. It was, it was bad. I can't imagine that I was living like that, like animalistic. It was just awful. I just realized that I was tired of going to rehab. I was tired of packing up everything that I own to go to this place for 30 days, and I just realized that I was wasting my life. Hi, I'm Mark. I'm an addict, and I have not used a drug or a drink since May 19th, 2014. I started smoking weed probably at 14 or 15, you know, cigarettes too, and I came to senior year and um, tore my ACL. That uh, sent me to the emergency room. I had to get surgery and uh, I was prescribed a, a pain medicine afterwards. And that sort of opened up a bigger door for using and it kind of left a big hole inside of me. So I eventually found heroin and definitely like, you know, that's kind of what brought me to my knees. That was like almost the end of my road. There really wasn't much else I wanted to do besides use heroin. 
once I found heroin. I remember growing up always like not being able to tell people how I felt or like maybe I wouldn't tell them how I felt just because I thought they wouldn't understand. It made me feel like very calm and it made me feel like I didn't care about anything. I went to jail, Dolphin County Prison, for about a year. You're obviously in one place for a long time, and then you get out and there's so much else moving around you. What do you do? The only thing I did was what I did before I got there, and that was really the only thing I knew how to do. I ended up having to go to the hospital twice in one night, and you know I vividly remember that. Um, I remember how I felt, and I remember leaving the hospital twice those two times I was there, I just ripped my IVs out and just walked home. And the next day I showed up at um, treatment. It was my parents' choice. I wasn't aware of what was going on because I was basically blacked out and overdosing. I basically came to at treatment and then I realized I was there and I was, uh, I was very mad. You know, I didn't really feel like around most people that I fit in, but those were definitely my people and like they, um, pretty much loved me back to life. I met Emily at a meeting. I actually met him at a meeting, and I knew him for a while, but I never really liked him because <laughs> he had a mohawk, and I didn't like his lip ring. I actually found enough courage to go up to say hi to her. She's cute. She's a little bit more reserved than me. I'm a lot more social and open, and there's a good mix between me and her. And then he messaged me, and we started dating shortly after that. What I love about him now is that he's so supportive, and he has more clean time than I do. So, like, if I'm struggling, he'll, he gives me a lot of, like, courage and wisdom and just what his experience was and how he got through those things that I struggle with. I proposed to her in Inner Harbor in Baltimore, and I think she saw it coming, but, you know, I got down on one knee, and I was like, will you be my wife? And um, she said yes. It was so sweet. When I found out I was pregnant, I was terrified. My son's name is Callias James Hogarth. Um, the James is after my brother. I feel more fulfilled now that I have him. I just, I don't know, he's just perfect and I couldn't imagine life without him. I definitely feel like it's my duty and responsibility now, now that I am clean to help other people. Like if I didn't have those people in the beginning, I wouldn't be here. I'd probably be dead. It's kind of just so implemented in my mind that I am responsible to help anyone who's sick and suffering anywhere, anytime. I know sharing my story um, may feel a little uncomfortable for me at times, but I've been doing it consistently for the past five years and it's, keep, it's kept me clean and it's helped a lot of people and it's helped me more. I'm starting to see what they said to me in the beginning of my journey, being clean that, you know, you'll have a life beyond your wildest dreams because there's no way I could have ever thought that this was possible. This is just the best life's been. I can tell you, I definitely sold myself short. I didn't think I would be married, have a loving wife and a new baby boy, let alone a car, a license, a place to live. All of the stuff that I have today is just completely a miracle. They say it's like a life beyond your wildest dreams and that's what it is. I never thought I'd get married. I never thought I'd have a son. I never thought I'd be living on my own and having a job that like I actually enjoy. I just, it's beyond my wildest dreams and I'm sure it's gonna get much better from here. It is beyond my wildest dreams. It truly is um, and that's something that I got told um, that would happen like in the beginning. And I remember just doubting that statement and being like, what's that even mean? Like, does that mean like nice cars, lots of money, um, you know, big family? Um, but it's really none of those things um, for me. You know, I've, I've gotten to just this place of at peace inside and this serenity and this just, I'm okay. And that is enough for me. Like that is more than I ever could have bargained for.